Great. I think that now we're going to ask the research group to come back up to the front of the room so we can do a QA. and a um, So uh, Dr. Day, uh, Dr. Jones, Dr. Williams, if I'm going to grab three chairs. And uh, if you guys could come back up. Um, I think you all inspired us, excited us, and also at, at moments probably confused us by some of the large terms. So um, I'm guessing that there are probably a few questions from the audience about research. Um, anybody want to start off? Anybody have a burning question? Yes? Uh, turn something like CRISPR, like President Bush did with stem cell research, where they stifled it, or is this a technology that you think could be stifled or, or regulated by the government or current administration? I wouldn't put anything past uh, the government. <laughs> However, I think that um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I think the scientific community as a whole is um, well aware and has been. One of the things we're trying to do is educate the public and politicians, if, if possible, to um, of, of the. We're not cavalier with these technologies, whether it was stem cells back then, the genome sequence. I mean, it's been the, the history of science. There's been these, these fears of, of the evil scientists using this to wreak havoc on the world. And I, I just don't think, you know, that hasn't borne out. Um, this is powerful technology that um, the scientific community worldwide has come together to self-regulate. And I don't think that, and that uh, I'm, not, I'm not concerned that um, it's going to be shut down, to tell you the truth, um, because we are, we are careful. And if anything, um, I, I think that's a benefit. Because, you know, people are aware of the of the potential dangers, and they're also aware of the benefits. And so, this is a worldwide effort to actually do good. I think, and I, I'm not I'm not concerned. You might actually want to. I'll, I'll, I'll just agree with you that I I think you know we can afford to let the rhetoric kind of die down a couple of notches here because the budget that he proposed that would you know really slash NIH isn't going to go forward. I mean, Congress isn't going isn't to allow the NIH to be decimated like that. So I think there's a lot of stuff that gets put out there that really isn't going to happen. So I think, you know, it, I, I think that CRISPR technology is, is, is actually, it's, very, it's, it's surprisingly mature for how recent a discovery it is, and that's not going to be stifleable. Great. Other Any other questions from the audience about the research? I presumably the Dux4 gene expresses some protein itself, and then you also investigated, you talked about the myostatin as a protein it, itself. One, there's some genetic expression that creates myostatin, I assume, and those are completely separate proteins. I, I understand that. But what do we know about the protein chains and how they affect the muscles? That I mean, I just, I, they, they were sort of separate in the so, talk. Today. So there's two different issues. So. Dux4 is a protein that, that everybody expresses when they were two cells, so a long time ago. Um, and <laughs> it's involved in developmental gene regulation, and then typically it's off the rest of the time. Um, it, when it is apparently on in FSHD, you actually express other downstream genes, downstream Dux4, that turn out to be detrimental. Dux4 itself can be immunogenic. Um, so that, that's kind of a different test. Now, with the myostatin, that's standard muscle regulation. Healthy muscle regulation, you have myostatin, it's restricting the um, overgrowth. Myostatin inhibition, you're overriding the system. You are still making more muscle, but that is FSHD muscle. You still have the D, you haven't changed the defect, you're just basically trying to beat the system. And that kind of gets to the question of if you don't have muscle, there's nothing to, to beat. Uh, to, to me, I think that the important thing is the way we think of these therapies is combinatorial therapy. In my opinion, myostatin inhibition is going to be great when combined with something that shuts down Dux4. Shut it down, you've stopped the decay, now let's build things back up. And uh, potentially stem cells, the way, stem cell therapy. There are a lot of other therapies that can play in combinatorially. But, you know, but the myostatin and the Dux4, those are just completely distinct in mechanisms. Um, I'm probably not as well read as some people here, but I, um, is there um, any estimate of anything either in muscular dystrophy in general or FSHD in specific muscular dystrophy that could be relevant to FSHD or FSHD that isn't, has done phase one or is approaching phase one clinical trials? And if so, how long until phase two? Uh, there, there are 
current uh, studies, for example, in the myostatin inhibition uh, world that, that are moving uh, probably into phase three fairly soon. Um, yeah, so it's, um, you know, with, with a, a different, I mean, so Acceleron is, is one approach, uh, but there are a couple of other uh, approaches that are, that are in clinical trials now and uh, there are others upcoming. So I, I think that's just one example. There, there are multiple approaches. There, there, I, I mentioned the, the um, now FDA-approved uh, treatment uh, with an antisense compound uh, for spinal muscular atrophy. There is an antisense also approved for muscular dystrophy. Um, the data on that isn't as clean, so I, I for, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the data for that isn't as clean, so I think the SMA story is, is a better story, uh, but, um, you know, th so I think that technology is, is actually quite far along, and, and there are antisense approaches, as Dr. Jones was saying, uh, for uh, uh, FSHD as well. So, I mean, there, there are multiple approaches, and I, I totally agree with his uh, point that, you know, some type of combination of things is probably going to be uh, the, the way we end up, the way we, where we want to be for FSH. Did you have other thoughts on that? Uh, question for Dr. Jones. In uh, your explanation of the epigenetics of the disease, you mentioned that... Um, environmental or developmental factors must be responsible for some of the symptomatic variability. What, what do we know about that? What are those specific environmental or developmental factors that are, that are causing the variability? So, um, not much. Uh, in experimentally in mice and in, in the lab, what we know is you can manipulate folate levels in the diet of mothers with, you know, and affect gene expression in their um, pups and that then it then becomes heritable to the next generation. So we do know that it's in the, you know, diet can affect, you know, this is a very controlled environment with very controlled systems. So it's more of a proof of principle that the diet environment, essentially I look at the epigenome, which may not be really clear, but it's the, the level of regulation above, basically the purpose of, just so I can see you, sir, um, the purpose of the epigenome is so you, the genome can integrate the environment into, into the genome, you know, different, um, Thank you so much. I teach a 40-lecture course on this. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry if you don't have to come across. So um, they're just, it, the genome can be manipulated by stress. It can be manipulated. So I, I would think that things like sleep, like stress, like diet, um, environmental factors, and we're not talking like mutagens. We're talking about just, you know, environmental conditions can affect, I believe, in utero, and, and, and also... Um, I would be surprised if it didn't affect uh, adults, but but we don't know. There's no there's no controlled studies on it. But this is a huge source of research, actually. But you know, in the lab, it's easy. We can do proof of principle because we can make mice that are genetically identical. You're not genetically identical to anyone, even if you're an identical twin. Um, yet we do see that identical twins have variable phenotypes. It's epigenetic. Now they have the same in utero environment, but there is something different that is not in the genome, likely that is affecting their epigene and is causing these differences. Um, so it's more like we know these things are out there, we just, and, and these are the basis of some of the clinical trials in Europe. There are some dietary, lot, some, oxidant, some dietary and lifestyle clinical trials that have been attempted and proposed over in Europe to see if you can affect um, life, uh, quality of life for FSHD. Now the problem gets back to exactly what Dr. Day showed, which is there's so much variability among people, how do you know that it's actually working? So, so it gets complicated, but I look at it more like from a, a drug development standpoint to say we know we can manipulate the epigenome. Um, let's just go directly to it and see if we can find small molecule drugs that will do what we want to do. But actually, from a, from, a, from a standpoint of just not understanding patients, you do hear about these plateaus and getting worse. You know, one thing that I would be curious to know, you lose your job and you're really stressed, you get divorced, does this cause a decline? I mean, are there life, are, could, could you, if you kept a journal of your life and things going on, are there events, high stress events, or are there things that maybe correlate with a decline later on? I'd, I'd be curious to know, but these types of studies have not really been done. Uh, it, I, I totally agree. The, um, the other element of environment that we sometimes fail to pay attention to is kind of the internal environment. 
so that you know the muscle environment can also directly affect the genetics of the muscle itself. So if you get infl inflammation in the muscle, that could have an effect on the epigenetics of the region, could then affect DUX4 expression, could then cause more damage, could then cause more inflammation. So you can easily see this kind of a cycle getting back where inflammation causes DUX4 expression, causes more damage and more inflammation. So I think it, it's a very, very rich and probably multifactorial system that can be attacked in a number of different ways. So, so then epigenetics can maybe help explain the asymmetry of FSHD? Um, I think asymmetry probably in some cases is mosaicism, but in people that are not mosaic, a absolutely. I think that also can affect, I mean, using the example of patients that first degree siblings, that our siblings are first degree relatives that have the same genetic mutation, have a completely very um, diff, diff divergent um, progression of disease, not just severity, but how it presents, we have actually shown those are epigenetically different at the FSHD locus. I mean, within within the same body. With the oh, same, within the same, same person, body, too. I, yeah, I, I, so but that, you know but what? that may be the inflammation you were kind of getting at. That's a great question, though, because we'd like to answer it, but the way we have to answer that is we'd need to take 10 biopsies from this Ten needle biopsies from here, and we can't we can't do it. We think, but we're actually trying to figure out because we we'd like to address that question because I, I would be shocked. I, I would think it's going to be you're going to have micro environments, either epigenetic or inflammatory, that are going to affect the asymmetry. Absolutely. Um, my question is for Dr. Day and Dr. Williams. Maybe um, I know we talk about not every FSHD patient is the same. Um, I can see that myself. Or with with uh, how my wife and her mother progressed, but h how can you say when you know you're looking for a clini clinical trial? We want this specific group with this specific thing because this almost seems to be it's no two patients are the same. <laughs> well, that's a that's a great question. Um, so it it. It is difficult, and that goes to speak to study design and how difficult that is and how much money and resources is put into a study design and how long it takes us to get to the later phases of our clinical trials. Um, we do, in most of our studies, not only in the neuromuscular world, in, in all studies, um, have pretty um, extensive inclusion and exclusion criteria. Are you familiar with, with that? So that helps normalize the, um, the, the data a little bit more so we can compare that to our controls, which are, are the normal population. And for example, in our Acceleron trial, um, where ex as I had mentioned before, excluding more of the, the weaker um, <coughs> FSH, patients, and um, I guess the thought behind that is that they will likely not make as much strength gains as somebody who has a little bit more muscle reserves. So uh, because we're targeting the uh, two muscles we're targeting are the biceps brachii here and the tibialis anterior in the front of the leg there, um, we're comparing um, the either side, so right and left. So we're injecting in only one side. So the muscle strength has to be at least a three to a four plus on, um, on a quantitative strength test on one, one side as compared to the other. Um, and the other side can be a, as much as three to five. So that's just one example of how we ex ex you know, it can exclude people to fit into a kind of more of a normal pattern, as we've shown a lot of graphs today. So we want our graphs to look normalized somewhat. Um, you know, and how that applies to the general population comes in the later stages of our study design and um, uh, clinical trials. Um, other exclusion criteria are people who are more severely affected that are, or have other co-committant diseases, such as um, um, maybe a sp spinal cord injury or scoliosis that inhibits them to, to ambulate or walk. So there's lots of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Mm -hmm. I'll just add one other point to this. This gets back to the issue I raised about 
any study is, is tremendously useful if we get a result. So that even if we do that and we had the wrong criteria and we designed it incorrectly, but we got the study done, that can be informative. So the Duchenne world, those are, I mean, I've been involved in Duchenne trials for 20 years, and it is, they have really evolved because we've gotten more and more sophisticated in terms of knowing what to look for, and we need to, we need to do that more quickly for FSH. The question is what might trigger a spontaneous mutation? I, um, you know, one of, one of the things that's interesting about the region, so that the D4-Z4 repeats on chromosome 4 are mirrored in other locations, so that there, there are similar ones on chromosome 10, for instance, and there are a couple other spots in the genome that have similar ones, but the ones on chromosome 10 especially will sometimes uh, get genetically confused uh, during a division of a cell, and they can, they, you can get a translocation that sometimes can be responsible for some shortening uh, of the region on chromosome 4. So I don't know, that might par play a part of it. And essentially, um, the repeat gene, half your genome is repeats, meaning sequence is repeated and repeated, and these um, are recombinogenic, and essentially it's a failed re recombination, but you're still talking about 1 in 20, that's a rare event, and when it, we've looked, um, Kevin Flanagan, I believe, looked in some Utah families that had the same mutation from the 1700s to the to current day, and there's no change. So once the de deletion had happened, for whatever reason, it's very, very stable in the family. So this is really something, I say, extremely unlucky to get the deletion. But, you know, there, there are mutations to the genome all the time. Repeat regions tend to be highly recombinogenic, just it's the nature of how DNA works. And so it's, uh, you know, but it's still, it's still very rare. But once it's in the family, that's actually one reason testing is very important to mention. Once it's in the family, it's going to be very consistent. It's going to be passed down 50%. Um, but the initial, the initial event, we don't really know why, and we don't, um, yeah, so it's a good question. <laughs> it's, it's I'm going to ask the audience a question now. Uh, how many uh, members of the audience have participated in some form of FSH research? Can we see a show of hands? About uh, six, eight people I'm seeing. Um, among those who haven't, who would be interested in possibly doing so in the future? Well, I see a bunch of hands going up. Uh huh. And among those who haven't, um, does anyone want to talk about what's kept them from doing it or why they have some reservations about doing it? So my muscles that are in the three to five range, I don't really want people messing with them. <laughs> and I do have a background in clinical research, so I feel like I am an educated person on that, but that definitely made me a little bit nervous. Anybody else want to comment on sort of their ambivalences or uncertainties about participation? Even though the phenotype is very strongly there, we haven't gotten a positive one or two test. Both of our tests came out negative, so we're not eligible. Yeah, so you might not qualify yet, I see. Okay. Anybody else want to comment? Do you need the DNA test in order to qualify for any studies? So the, so the, the question to the researchers, the, the, the question to the researchers, Karen, maybe, I mean, uh, Lisa, maybe you can start, is does one need a genetic diagnosis in order to participate in the research, right? So most studies, I think you do. Um, some will accept a, um, a positive genetic test for FSH from a family member, um, either first generation, so brother, sister, or a parent. Yeah, they, uh, usually they do require it one way or the other, but they'll often do it. If you haven't had it done clinically, they can do it as part of the research study and then keep that result, you know, in their research files if for some reason you don't want it in your medical records. To try to do the um, trial up in Portland, and they told me that I have to have a positive test and they won't pay for it, and it's over $2,000 out of pocket. Yeah, that, that needs to be fixed. <laughs> That's, uh, I, I would fight back on that. Um, so we're just about out of time, and the reason I pose that question is um, certainly one of the, um, the themes of the day has been sort of personal empowerment, and um, I think a lot of people came today because they wanted to hear what is the state of research, 
and um, you know, it strikes me as uh, you know the the opportunity is, lies largely within the room. The people of the Bay Area who, or the greater Northern California area, um, who are most interested in FSH decided to come today, most of them. And um, so it is our community that can really help accelerate some of the trials. Um, so I just throw that out there and have everybody, you know, think about the role that you want to play personally in helping um, move the whole field forward. Um, which may help you, might help your family members, might help others in the community eventually, um, but it's one of the ways that we can all um, contribute. And I think that of all the people who have FSH here, none of you would label yourself as, I am a patient with FSH. You're a person with a very busy, complicated, interesting life who happens to have FSH. Nobody wants to have FSH as sort of the central part of their life, but it is a way of you giving something back if you have that to contribute. So I just throw that out there for everybody. We are one of the multiple centers that are participating in the Acceleron ACE 083 trial, which is the myostatin inhibitor trial. And Dr. Day, you just completed a trial on ATIRA. It's a an anti, a novel anti-inflammatory. It's quite fancy, actually. It's a biological compound. but. Um, uh, yeah, and we have other trials going. We also have other studies going. So, you know, this gets back to the need to identify appropriate ways of measuring and understanding that curve that we've drawn a few times uh, so that there are, are other studies that, that people can participate in. Um, and, you know, we're eager to have people sign up. So, um, yeah, I congratulate you all for coming. I mean, you know, you guys are, are great and, you know, should pat yourself on the back, you know, of having gotten up and gotten here. Um, you know, and we just want to keep spreading the word, you know, so that the whole community uh, can be involved. So, thank you. Was your question also sort of, what is the, where can I go and look and see what are the options for trials? Um, do we have something like that on the website, a, a list of all the clinical trials that are available? I think that there is a, something on the website for people who want to um, understand what the options are uh, in terms of, you know, uh, stage of disease, uh, location of trial, what's expected of the, of the individual, is there any cost associated, any, any recompense, et cetera. So I think the, the website can answer a lot of those questions. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. So the University right. of Rochester Registry, for anyone who's not aware of it, that is kind of the central place for a lot of the trials. No, okay, Friends of FSH Research? No, just Friends, Friends, of FSH. Friends of FSH and Living with FSH. I'm not, an, I'm not a Facebooker, so that's not dot .com, that's just, that's all you put in, right? <laughs> are doing research, I'm very, very grateful to them and very encouraged, and I, from the bottom of my heart, I thank all of you. And that's my wife, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a great note to end on, is a, a, our appreciation to the researchers who came to visit with us today and tell us about all the work that they're doing. I, I wonder if we could just give them a nice big uh, round of applause and a great appreciation. And then, and then also for our for our presenters, uh, Dr. Day um, and uh, uh, Lee and 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 Richard, thank you uh, for the first part of the day, and also Howard, uh, thank you guys as well for your presentations. And most of all, I just want to thank everybody who came today and contributed in really important ways.